Hi everyone. In this installment of Programming for Lovers, we're going to take what we've learned about how to simulate rolling dice to implement the popular dice game called Craps. As a result, we will build a Monte Carlo simulation that runs millions of randomized trials in order to estimate just how much we would lose in the long run sitting in a casino playing a game like Craps. As always, if you enjoy what you see, please like and subscribe. Plus, check your work from this code along and unlock tons more content at programmingforlovers.com. Clickety-clack and let's code. To get started, we are going to work with the main.go file within our dice directory that we created in the previous code along. Now I've cleared out func main for us and we're gonna need a couple of functions that we wrote in the previous code along and I've got those present here as well. In particular, first we're going to need a sum dice function that's gonna take the number of dice that we're going to roll as an input and then return the sum of that number of dice, simulated dice rolls. So in particular, we're gonna use num dice equal to two when we simulate the game of craps. We're always gonna only be rolling two dice at a time, but I've got this nice general function and it's short because as you might remember from the previous code along, we leveraged the fact that we wrote a roll die subroutine, which simulates the process of rolling only a single die and returns a pseudo random integer between one and six inclusively. With all that established, the first thing that I would like to do, keeping in mind that I want to eventually compute the house edge of the game of craps, which is the average amount that we're going to win, or I should say lose, on a single game of craps over time, is to write a function that plays the game of craps once. And so that function is going to be called play craps once. And what it does is simulates one game of craps. So as input, um, it's not gonna need to take anything. And as output, well, it's going to return true if the game is a win and false if it's a loss. And that's from the perspective of the player. You might not also not have a significant background with dice games or specifically know the rules of the game craps. And there are a number of different things that one can wager upon. I'm gonna be presenting a relatively simple form of the game of craps solely from the perspective of the person who's rolling the dice. We have a lengthier explanation of this on our Programming for Lovers website that you're welcome to check out. I'm gonna walk through the rules of the game as we simulate, or as we implement, I should say, the function. So the function here is gonna be called play craps once. As I said, it takes no inputs, and it's gonna return whether we win or lose. So it's gonna return this Boolean value, true or false. And the first thing that I'm going to do is roll the dice. And so, um, in the game of craps, you might be rolling the dice more than once, or you might just be rolling it once. And so I'm gonna have an initial roll that I'm gonna call first roll. And here is where I'm going to call my sum dice function and give it as input two. So I'm, I'm summing two dice. And there are a number of possibilities here. If the roll happened to be a seven or 11, so if first roll is equal to seven, it's very tempting to write or 11 in this way, but it's or first roll is equal to 11 because we need to be having an expression that we can evaluate as a Boolean expression and the number 11 is not a Boolean expression. So we have to be precise here. If first roll is equal to seven or if first roll is equal to 11, well, then we won. And so we should return true and the function is simply over. There's also a losing scenario on our first roll, which is if the first roll is equal to two, if it's equal to three, or if it's equal to 12, we're called box cars. Um, and in this case, we're going to return false. So unfortunately in those case, in that particular case, we lose the game. And now it's more likely to roll a seven, for example, than it is to roll a two or a 12. Um, so in practice, you have a, a good chance of winning the game at the first in, during the first roll, but actually the likeliest possibility is that you don't roll a two, three, 12, seven, or 11 at all in the first roll. And then you're gonna have 
um, additional possibilities. And so if you roll anything else, for example, a four, then this can be summarized by saying, you keep rolling, I should say keep rolling, until you hit a seven or your original roll. Okay. And so I will have a while loop that's just going to run forever. One way of doing this would be to have while true. You actually don't need this. And according to Go specifications, if you want to just do something until a condition is obtained, you can just have the word for. So this is like while forever. Okay. Um, and you might worry about this type of function that's going to have uh, a while loop that's going on and on and on forever. But we're going to ensure that with probability equal to one, it's eventually going to stop in the same way that if you're playing this game in a casino, you're not worried that you're going to be standing there rolling the dice forever. Eventually the game will terminate. And so, as I said, how this works is that you continue rolling until you either hit your original roll, which was stored in this first roll variable, or you obtain a seven. So I'm going to have a new roll variable that's equal to some dice of two. So I'm going to roll two dice, take their sum, and that's going to be my new roll variable. And now if new roll is equal to what I saw on the first roll, then that's good. In this particular case, we're going to return true, which is a winner. Whereas if on your first roll, if you rolled a seven, that was a winner on your first roll, now seven becomes poison. 11 doesn't, but seven does. And so we'll have else if new roll is equal to seven, we're going to return false. And so you're a loser in this case. And that's the function playcrafts once. So as I said, you have this potentially infinite loop that in practice is not going to be infinite because eventually you're going to either roll the dice and obtain your first roll or you're going to obtain a seven. It might take you some time to get there. It might take you a few rolls, but you will get there. And now that we have that function, we can compute the house edge of craps by running a Monte Carlo simulation that simulates the process of playing the game of craps multiple times. So we're simply going to have an engine here that calls this play craps once function many, many times and keeps track of how much that we've won or lost. And that's what the compute house edge of craps function is going to do. Um, I should call it compute craps house edge since there are many potential games that we could play. Uh, estimates the house edge of craps over many simulations. I should say multiple simulations. Okay, so the input needs to be an integer corresponding to the number of simulations that we want to run. And the output will be the house edge of craps. So this is the average amount won or lost over the number of simulations. Okay. And so our function is called compute craps house edge. It takes as input, I'm going to call it num trials, and that's an integer. And it needs to take to return as output a value that's an average. So it's going to be a decimal because it's going to be representing per dollar amount or per unit of currency, I should say, how much we're going to win, in which case it's going to be positive, or lose, in which case that average is going to be negative. So the very first thing that I'm going to do when writing this function is to declare a count variable equal to zero, and that's going to keep track of the amount one positive or lost, in which case it's negative. And the next thing that I want to do is to say, well, what is, how is it that I'm going to use that count? At the very end, if I've won money, I'm going to have it positive. If I've lost, it's going to be negative. But I'm doing, running this over a number of simulations. And so I want to, because I want an average, I want to divide at the very end the amount of money that I have won or lost by the number of trials. And I need to be a little bit careful there 
as you might remember with previous code alongs, Go wants us to specify this as a decimal division if it truly is a decimal division. Otherwise, we have two integers that we're dividing, and it would be an integer division where you would throw away the remainder. So here I need to make sure that I cast count and num trials to floats so that Go knows to do this division as a division of decimals. The rest of this function is going to be relatively straightforward because most of the hard work has already been completed by our playcrafts once, once function. So I want to run n trials and update count accordingly. So when I say that, I will have a for loop that will start i at zero. I will go up to, but not including num trials, and I will increase by one each time. And now we're going to play the game. So we're going to play the game one time, and I'll say my current outcome is the result of playing the game of craps once. And remember, that's a Boolean value. It's either true or false. So if outcome is equal to true, then I won. And if I'm a winner, then I can count plus plus. And in keeping with good coding practice, these sorts of statements, outcome equal equal true, are not technically necessary. We can simply check outcome and see, well, if outcome is equal to true, I'm going to enter that if block. So we're going to be good to go. If outcome is not equal to true, well, I know that we were a loser. And as a result, I want to subtract one from count. So I'm either losing my initial bet or I'm winning the game, in which case I'm getting that bet back plus an extra unit of currency. And then at the very end, I'm going to take the total amount that I've won or lost, and after converting it to a decimal, divide it by the number of trials that I've played the game. And that's it. These two functions together constitute a Monte Carlo simulation of the game of craps, keeping track of that house edge. It also goes to show you how nice it can be to pass the details of the hard work of your function to a subroutine. So I could have written this function at once, and then thinking about having to put all this code from the playcraps once subroutine all into here, that would have gotten so messy and ugly, and I would have so much indentation and all that stuff. All that goes away when we write a subroutine, and that's going to be something that we see as a hallmark of this course over and over and over again. That's our function then. Let's run it. So let's go up into func main, and maybe I should save this first and make sure I don't have any compiler errors. I've been talking for a lot, and usually when I talk and code a lot, I incorporate a lot of bugs. So let's see. We're going to navigate into SRC Dice, and I'm going to go build. Remember to save. So I saved before I did that. And I don't have any compiler errors, which might be a minor miracle. And we're ready to fill in some code in Funk Main. To do that, let's first establish the number of trials that we want to run. So let's set number of trials equal to, I'm going to start number of trials is equal to 1,000. So I've got code that I know is going to run really quickly. And then I'm going to estimate the house edge. And we could print this in a, a little bit of a nice fashion. So let's say estimated house edge with um, num trials trials is, and then let's say compute craps house edge of num trials. And so I can save that. I'm going to come back down in my terminal where I navigated into my src slash dice directory. I'm going to compile again, and I'm going to run with dice.exe on Windows or dot slash dice on a Mac machine. And I get that the estimated house edge with 1,000 trials is negative 0 0.008. This means that, for example, for every dollar that I wagered, in a single trial, I lost 0 0.008 dollars. So that amounts to like 0.8 cents per dollar that I wagered. That, of course, is also subject 
to random chance, or I should say pseudo random chance, because as we have seen, the number generation process is not truly random, but it's random for our purposes. Note what happens when I run this multiple times. So I didn't need to save and compile my code because it's already been compiled. I didn't edit it at all. It's just running a different simulation. And as we saw in the previous code along, we're gonna get a different sequence of random numbers every time we run this simulation, which means that the outcome of our games are gonna be different. And so in this particular case, I didn't plan this, this was just worked out that we had a loss the first time. And this time we actually had a win. This time for every dollar that we wagered, we won 4.6 cents per trial, which is pretty good. So we did, so far we're doing well. And I could keep running these simulations and probably what you're gonna see is sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. On average, I'll give you a hint that we're gonna lose more often than we win. We did really well on that. And so one of the things that we're seeing actually is that the game of craps tends to have a pretty high variance. So running only a thousand trials is not actually telling us a great deal about what the house edge is. If you just play it for a little bit of time, you might lose a lot or you might actually win a lot. And that variance is in part why people play the game. However, say that we boost the number of trials. Say that I go from a thousand trials to a hundred thousand trials. Now let's save this. We're staying at this craps table for a depressingly long time. And after I've saved this, the code changed. So I want to compile my code again, and then I want to run my code again. Now I see a loss when I play for 100,000 trials. And here I see I'm losing about 1.8 cents per dollar wagered on every game that I play on average. And when I run that again, and run that again, you'll note each time that we run this simulation, it's certainly possible for us to win. But in practice, we're not actually coming out a winner. And so I could run this as many times as I like, and I'm seeing that with 100,000 games, in the long run, I'm starting to hone in on losing pretty consistently between either one cent or two cents per dollar wagered per trial. What we're seeing is just one in instance of the law of large numbers, which in this particular case means the more trials that we add here, and I'm going to take it now up to 10 million, the more trials that we run, the closer we're going to hone in on the average behavior that happens in the long run. So after I add this, uh, uh, make this 10 million trials, compile, save, compile, and then run my code, I'm now getting even tighter in on a true value. So you'll see now everything's starting to begin with negative 0.014. And I can run this however many times I like, and I'm basically starting to really hone in on that value. That approximate value of about 0.014, or about 1.4 cents per dollar wagered per game that we play is the true house edge of craps. And it's why the casino's not tremendously worried about individual winners because it knows in the long run, it's going to on average beat everyone. That's it for this code along. Congratulations to you, by the way. You just built your first Monte Carlo simulation. And we also learned that in the long run, the house always wins. Next, we're gonna take the next steps and build another Monte Carlo simulation where we simulate a US presidential election from polling data. I sure hope you'll join me. Happy coding.